So, uh, so the gentlemen who are on stage, uh, 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 Erwin uh, Vestralen, I'm sure I'm American, so therefore, by definition, I have butchered your name, <laughs> according, <laughs> according to what you said earlier. It's acceptable. Okay, probably. <laughs> that sounded like a B minus, but that's all right. No problem. Uh, Charles, we just met you. We heard about from you just a moment ago. Michael, uh, Michael Schaffner. Uh, so, uh, and then Nico, we heard from you earlier, and and Al Alexander, our uh, 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 Varvarenko, uh, who who I don't think you you've been on the stage yet. You are the CEO of Velis Bulk and and Shipnext, and so yeah. maybe what we'll do is we're going to ask you in just a little bit to to tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I have a mic. Um, and, and then I think what you guys are going to have to do is, is hand over the mic between okay. you. Is that, is that correct? This is a blockchain. It's a blockchain. <laughs> See, look at this, a live version of a blockchain. Okay. This is exactly how it works. It's called collaboration. Isn't that what it's Transfer all about? Of ownership of the mic. Ownership of the mic, right. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, okay. Oh. so let, let us talk about okay. This, okay. Uh, this question. Um, uh, Charles, you just said a moment ago, I heard you loud and clear, I was taking, I was taking diligent notes uh, based on what you said, you cannot plug into eight blockchains. So therefore, uh, there's gonna be maybe 800 blockchains. I don't know how many blockchains there are gonna be, but every day uh, I come into the office and I look through my inbox and sure enough, there's a new press release from a new blockchain startup that is, has declared themselves to be an active participant and invariably, in some cases, they will have an ICO where they're going to miraculously raise tens of millions of dollars in the course of 35 seconds. Uh, they are, they, they uh, may even publish a 40 or 50 page white paper. These white paper documents that I have seen from, uh, from blockchain startups are truly prodigious and a lot of time. And so anyway, uh, uh, and, um, and Nico, you mentioned uh, Cosmos, this uh, initiative out there. I went on the website. I couldn't quite tell if it was a company or if it was a nonprofit mm -hmm. uh, undertaking for the purpose of creating uh, the, what is a, a word that is, I've known a long time, but it is now getting new, new usage, which is interoperability, this idea of blockchains talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about interoperability? Will, these block will blockchains be able to talk to each other? How re is, is it just, oh, you wave a magic wand and blockchain starts, blockchains start to talk to each other? Or how hard is it? Uh, uh, do do the, the, uh, everybody who agreed to the standards for the first blockchain then have to agree to the standards for the second blockchain or else you'll never be able to connect them? Um, how big of an obstacle is this? And I realize this is a long-winded question, how, and I'd like all of you to weigh in, please. How big of it is uh, an obstacle is this to, to take all these different blockchains that are out there and get them to talk to each other for the purpose of ultimately creating some kind of coherent system where where blockchain is used in productive ways, not just by narrow, little narrow segments of the market, but hopefully where the market overall is benefiting. Well, please. Uh, Nick, yeah. or is it me or Nick? No, the rest. Uh, I will you, start maybe on that. Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. But first of all, I think you should distinguish between uh, enterprises or port community systems interconnecting to blockchains with um, blockchains that talking to each other. Yeah? Uh, to have blockchains talking to each other, you need interoperability. And for that, indeed, uh, there is still a way to go. Yeah? Technically, for the moment, it's not yet working. So every blockchain cannot talk to another blockchain. So it's, it's an island, and there is no possibility to bridge to uh, go from one island to the other. So as it stands island. today, blockchains are not interoperable. That's exactly. But okay. there are now very, very smart people working on this, and, um, mm. I, and they have a plan, and that's the Cosmos. Yeah. So it's an, uh, uh, the Cosmos uh, initiative. Yeah. This is, um, these are uh, the people uh, behind this initiative are, uh, I find, very clever guys and who are, who are uh, more or less the inventors of, uh, of, of, of blockchain technology. So they will resolve this, I'm, I'm sure about that. 
Um, but another thing is, okay, how to interface with blockchain, mainly the legacy systems. And I understand that, that companies will not be willing to do eight different developments yeah, um, to first to interconnect with the MERSC blockchain, then with the whatever port of Antwerp blockchain, etc. So there you need uh, standardization. Um, and, and we see there the first, first initiatives uh, being taken. But unfortunately, that's, that, that will also take, take time. Yeah? For instance, the UN CFACT uh, committee, mm -hmm. and if I'm not mistaken, these are the guys uh, who um, standardized the EDIFACT messages. If I, I've been told I'm not a uh, member of those uh, committees, but they are now um, okay, working also on blockchain and um, uh, trying to standardize the interface, how to okay, talk to a blockchain. Um, Good. I yeah. get it. I understand. Thank you. Uh, I understood. So basically, not yet, but people understand it's a problem and they're trying to fix it. Correct. Yes. Okay. Good. Charles. And then Erwin, I want to hear from you because I know you have opinions on this subject. Well, I have the luxury of having uh, Mike Schaffner as my internal customer. And if he demanded that we build eight interfaces, we would. But the idea behind it is probably improbable. I like the idea behind going towards standards. Um, you know, we want to drive increased pro productivity optimization. Uh, we want to see standards so we can minimize the number of interfaces. But quite frankly, since my colleague is here from commercial marketing, the new chief commercial officer for Port Houston, um, we want to drive customer stickiness in their overall satisfaction. We want them to stay with us so that we can continue to do certain things as it relates to data sharing. But um, I believe that over time, it's a journey. I saw numbers like 2028. We're going to have something called Port. Houston's vision for 2040, that seems a little more realistic to me uh, for the, the fact of what we're, where we are in the middle of the supply chain. But I, I can't emphasize enough, if you heard all the data points that we're willing to share, there are data points that we would need back if we're going to participate. Maybe in a little bit we'll ask you about how that's going in the context of the MERSC IBM initiative, because you've got some insider knowledge about that. Erwin, t what about this subject of interoperability? Well, I'm fairly optimistic about it because well, interoperability has been a topic we've been discussing about for the better part of the last three decades. Huh? That was the big fun in IT. Huh? How do you make systems talk the moment computers started to get connected to one another? Huh? So I think you have to make a distinction between data standards, what do we exchange and how do we understand that, and the technical details below it. And I think Cosmos is primarily on the technical integration between blockchains, yeah. not so much on and what kind of information do we exchange and how is that standardized, because that's what we have been doing for the better part uh, of the last few decades. And that is, I think, the most tricky one in the sense that that's where the stakeholder alignment comes in and takes time and emotions and all these kind of things. So, And it would have been very naive to think that we would have only have one blockchain and that would be it. Maybe we're taking a little bit off guard because of the first implementation of blockchain that was visible to the outside world being Bitcoin that created the illusion that there was only one blockchain. But that is not the case and that's certainly not going to stay. That's, that, that's going to stay like that. Uh, so, um, yes, of course, that's always the same thing with a new technology. Standards have to be defined, developed, uh, but we got used to that as well. Uh, certainly since the, the dawn of open source and there is a sort of a, a community kind of idea that evolved and a willingness to move on, adapt, learn, uh, not be afraid to come out with an, uh, a minimum viable product that you know is not finished yet, but as you implement it, you learn and you adapt. Huh? Mm -hmm. So I'm fairly optimistic about that. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so now I want to get into a, a, another uh, another topic, and, and Alexander, maybe you could weigh in on this one as well. Uh, it's this question of how 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 uh, a blockchain is going to be is going to be how is it going to take hold? So so we were talking earlier about EDI, and and uh, Erwin and Nico, you guys had mentioned EDI when you were talking. Well, one of the ways that EDI actually became widely used 
and this goes back to the early 1980s, was that the major auto, the big three auto companies all said that anybody who is selling to them, any of their suppliers, have to send invoices over EDI. And because they were such enormous buyers of, of parts, components, uh, various and sundry other supplies that they needed in, or in order to build automobiles, the vendors had to comply. You know, they had leverage and they could say, you will use this system. Well, the way that blockchain appears to be going right now is that it's not being customer led. Now, Erwin, you said that you have the, the chairman of your port community system is a BCO, a, you know, which is a, 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 you know, a BCO for those of you who don't know their term, that's a, it's sort of ocean speak for Wal Walmart or ExxonMobil or Archer's Daniels Midland, a big customer of ocean container carriers. Uh, but the, but it's been driven so far by, say, Maersk, who is a big carrier, trying to say, all right, here's a blockchain. I want to get customers to use it. Uh, it's not being driven by Walmart going to ocean carriers or going to the rest of the industry and saying, I, you must use it. Um, do you see any of the any of, of this dynamic at play, and and is it relevant at all? And and I'd be interested in any anybody else who has a view on this. Is it relevant in this environment that we're talking about? Well, or, if you allow not? if you allow me first to introduce myself, I will uh, tell you a, a, a bit about uh, about our development. Uh, we have um, actually started from the shipping um, sector primarily because this is a stumbling block. You know, trucking the port is relatively easy to plan. The, the shipping was always the problem. There is a crucial thing to it, is which is actually building an algorithm. An algorithm based on, for example, which we use is a linear programming. Uh, and that allows you to, to take all those 37 to 50,000 ships in the world and to put them in a working mechanism on an algorithm which looks similar to Uber. Uh, we created a platform which is, which is up and running since October, and we are building up critical mass every day. We have thousands of cargoes coming in every day. Every day we have at any given moment 9,000 ships there matching itself instantly. So, um, well, basically in, in, in few words, we created a system or a platform which does all the work of all my managers in just one second. It processes emails, matches it to cargo, and um, allows you to create a smart contract. In June, we are executing the first electronic bill of lading, first smart contract in shipping and allowing our clients to create the first transaction. Mm -hmm. We are now going further. Once we have shipping done, we can, um, and, and by, by shipping I mean uh, the general cargo and the bulk cargo primarily. Um, and from the technical side, it looks uh, as, uh, as an algorithm with it, which allowed in initially to match one cargo to one ship from one port of loading to one port of discharge. And now it became a more sophisticated, matching several cargos on one ship instantly um, like Uber pool, yeah, in simple words, from one port of loading to one port of discharge. And further on, it can be extended into a real-time container booking system. And this is why we are talking to some carriers to try and create a real-time container booking system. Um, and with that, we can, uh, and we started al also already talking to some ports, we can start helping interact with, with ports for a proper planning. And once that is done, you can, and that of course involves EDI, just to answer your question, then you can start linking it to the Uber freight or any land solution because it's the ship which is a limiting factor. It's slower and while it, you know, you need a window for it and this is why you need a, 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 a two-way communication with the port. And once you plan properly with the port, you can start planning the, a more fast uh, mode of transport which is trucking or rail. So, so are you saying that, okay, instead of, you know, getting back to my question, uh, basically that where momentum is going to be created in order for uh, a blockchain infrastructure to take hold in, in the maritime industry, that, that actually uh, uh, platforms like yours that, that are gaining momentum uh, are, are, could actually be the driving force as opposed to big customers saying that I want, you know, telling their vendors, I want you to use this system and in effect forcing them to do that. 
platform like ours allows us to bring, uh, build a critical mass. Uh, but however, the final goal for us as well is to decentralize, uh, right, uh, decentralize our own uh, development. So the final uh, solution we are building is an open source code, which we will allow uh, sub individual supply chains or individual groups uh, integrate our algorithm into the asset management. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, M Michael and Charles, how do you uh, c come at this question as it relates to your, the, the interaction that you've had with, with Maersk and IBM, where this is obviously a carrier-driven uh, approach. I mean, they'll say that their customers are benefiting from it, obviously. Uh, but but do, you, do you see a, you know, you know, the approach that they're taking, for example, uh, being able to gain traction um, in the market just because it's got, you know, IBM behind it, you know, behemoth technology company, Maersk being the largest container carrier. Yeah, so uh, the fact of whether it was Maersk or, or MSC or, or CMA for that matter or any other shipping line is, is uh, probably less relevant than, than what we've discussed so far, right? Uh, you know, we're viewing this as there's an opportunity for us to participate uh, for what is potentially uh, an impactful piece of technology that's going to be out there. Uh, and so far, we're, we're doing that. Uh, but we're doing it with caution. If I get back to your question in terms of a BCO saying, you will do this in order to get my freight, uh, that has not come back to us yet. Uh, my opinion is that a lot of the BCOs are probably somewhat still concerned about having all this data out there. Um, it is... Uh, when you start getting this information, people see whose different customers are, uh, and they're going to want to make sure that their uh, commercial uh, perspective is protected while being able to share all this information. Uh, we as a port, in terms of our data, we have a responsibility to not allow uh, those that don't own the data uh, to gain access to it. So, you know, if, if uh, our current blockchain participant being Maersk IBM uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that they have no ability to understand what happens with a competitor's cargo, right? Um, and so, you know, to, to your point, uh, we, I've not been approached or I haven't seen it says, uh, a BCO says you will do this for our business yet. Yeah. Um, so, ha so. Sorry, just to, uh, yeah, just to add on please. Mike's uh, comment, I think the, the reason why sometimes you don't see what's happening with others is because there is no common algorithm which is trustable. You know, you, you, can't comp you know, you can't at the same time compete and try to join forces to make it transparent. You need, an, you know, just like, again, a, a, perhaps a simple example, but pretend you are you're an owner of 10, 10 cars and I'm an owner of 20 and we want to start working together. The only way to make us work together is an algorithm like Uber. And then we both trust it. Yep. Um, Michael, I guess I'm confused about one thing. I mean, one of the things that we keep hearing about blockchain is that data is secure. And, uh, and Erwin, we heard from you earlier saying that one of the, one of the fundamental principles of the, uh, of, the, of the Antwerp port system is that uh, data is permissioned and, and confidential to the degree it's not permissioned. Uh, but it sounds like there uh, might be a certain level of uh, uh, distrust that, that still, and may, or, or lack of comfort, maybe that comes from lack of knowledge, as to, uh, as to who's going to see what data, because obviously it's very uh, important that only certain people see certain data, or else it doesn't work, plain and simple. That yeah, it's a, and that's a chicken and egg kind of thing, eh? but um, the, the truth is that expecting that everyone in in a process just going to share the data they have just because you know, it sounds like a great idea is not going to work yeah. so uh, to, s to a large degree uh, data still is power uh, it, it gives you a certain position in a certain process so uh, enforcing that upon our communities is certainly not the way to move forward. Uh, uh, and that's what we, okay, we, we have anticipated that. It's not a question of we have learned that because that would sound like we didn't see it coming. Uh, uh, the founders of the platform said, okay, this is key in creating trust and then move forward. Uh, and you do so, you do move forward, but it takes some time. And it is not specific for supply chain or whatever. Prior worked for a large retail 
group, you sit around the table with the same kind of, uh, with your colleagues in the sector, and it's the same thing. Huh? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you have to make a distinction between you know, the data is safe, technologically speaking, huh? and the data is safe because I have control on who can access what. The two different things. Huh? Huh? Mm -hmm. um, but it's a question, uh, it's a, uh, why do we have that discussion? Partly because people are not net, not yet knowledgeable about it. Eh? They hear the, hear about blockchain, but what is it? And I don't get it. And what the heck are you doing? Blah blah blah. Combined with your know, distrust, eh? historically that was the case. Eh? Uh, combined with if I hold the data, I'm important. If I give the data away, what do I get back? So it is a question of finding common ground, win-win approaches, and then you move on. Mm -hmm. But if you say, give me all your data, and then I'm going to eliminate you, uh, it's not going to fly. Yeah. Yep, understood. So Charles and Michael, I want to get into, I want to get back to what you were saying earlier, your, your comment about how you cannot connect to eight blockchains. Well, we have the IBM Maersk blockchain. They've already approached you. You're already working with them to some degree. Uh, but last week, we heard pretty loud and clear from two of Maersk's competitors that they are not going to join that project. Uh, that was very clear from what the Hapag Lloyd CEO said, and it was also very clear from the, the, the one CEO, Jeremy Nixon, the combined Japanese carriers. H how is this going to get resolved? Is th will there be one platform that will come into existence? Uh, uh, if not, I mean, how do, you, how do you reconcile the fact that you can't connect to eight blockchains and yet you have more than one carrier at your port. Well, uh, I'm probably not going to answer your question, but I have a couple of um, ideas and comments. Um, I think people need to go back to the keynote speech this morning and look at the bullet points there and the, the follow-on by T-Mining. I think there will be some type of port-based communities. There will be consortiums probably here in the U.S. that will drive some of the standards and interconnections. We'll come to some point after we get through the trough of disappointment, whatever Gartner calls that, and then we'll start to see products, product, productized platforms that we can take advantage of. There was a picture in one of Irwin's diagrams where he showed a box in front of each individual consumer of data. Um, that means I have to do something on my side to be able to connect to everyone else because I might have, have a clearinghouse that ensures that I trust who I trust, and sometimes I think two-factor authentication to get technical <laughs> is I have something I have and something I know. Well, if I can figure out how to have those communities or those virtual worlds um, inside of whatever platform might be, um, that might be useful as we move forward. But I'll close with this comment for uh, Port Houston overall. Uh, we wanna, we're going to continue to partner with the Port of Antwerp because we believe that they're doing some things that are way ahead and we're doing some things that might help them move along as well. And, two ports of our size with the impact we have in our regions, that's an, uh, an important partnership for us. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Michael, you want to take a stab at that question? Yeah, I think we're learning. You know, the, the fact that it's Maersk and IBM are just because they came to us first. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be somebody else tomorrow. Uh, so uh, as an industry, we're learning and we're, we're easing our way into this. Uh, we have a responsibility, number one, to make sure any sort of integration does not have a negative impact back on our terminal operating system. Um, and that's, that's the primary concern every time we integrate with any technology. And there's solutions there. That's not a, uh, a mountain that can't be overcome. But uh, that, that's our primary concern every time we integrate with something new. Understood. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys one question, and, and any of you feel free to jump in. And then after that... With the with the time that we we're gonna we're gonna end at around noon, Rip, is that right? Because people are hungry. I get I get it, and believe me, we're, we won't go one minute over. I promise. <laughs> I, I would like to I add mean. on this point with uh, Maersk and IBM. I think I think I think we should not idealize the word uh, blockchain. There are different sides to it. To as far as I know, they are building uh, a, an electronic bill of lading, which is basically not not that spectacular. I mean, this is just a one. Uh, stumbling block in the in the full process and and, and even if you get across uh, uh, people saying okay blockchain is this transparency of a product m movement it's also not the ultimate goal this is just an additional feature to the to the to the it's like a bonus on top that you get when you actually build a blockchain is indeed the transparency mm -hmm. yep. but 
please. Yep, good, as good point. I, I don't want to speak for Mursk, but uh, as I said in oh, my... Feel free. Uh, no, no. <laughs> as I said in my keynote, uh, if you have a certain position, you have to lead by example. You know? And Mursk is a leading shipping company in the world. IBM is a leading technology company in the world. I think primarily they're after in changing something fundamentally, and that is what counts. There's too much focus on the blockchain part in that initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that underemphasizes what this is really about, uh, getting after that additional piece of operational efficiency that's lying on the table that everybody's hurting from because of that scattered landscape and lack of data sharing. Well, it's, it's low hanging fruit. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And we have so much to gain from it that, okay, they just said, listen, whatever everybody else thinks about it, we're gonna do something. And that, that deserves credit right? yeah. and then from there on we'll see what evolves yeah. uh, yeah. but it's the same for any kind of initiative that takes place around the world you know Un understood and actually that gets to my you know where I, where I wanted to go with the discussion in in the time we have remaining and then, and then I wanted to open it up for any questions and I realize whoever if you want ha want to ask a question you have to stand up and I'm sorry if you want to ask a question you're gonna have to you're gonna have to walk up to the mic so there's gonna be no anonymity in, in asking questions um, Oh, uh, oh, is that right? Are questions coming in over the... Uh, we have over some Twitter questions coming in. Go ahead. Yeah, we have some Twitter questions, but we also have for those uh, that want to come up and get to Twitter. Is this on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got a loud enough voice. So what we're doing is uh, if you haven't submitted a question by Twitter and you'd like to ask a question, you're more than welcome to come up to the mic. Uh, and by a show of hands, can I see who all is interested to expand a couple extra minutes to the panel? Uh, that would cut in about five, ten minutes into lunch. So can I see by a show of hands who is agreeable to that? Excellent. Okay, over half. So uh, we got an extra ten minutes for the panel uh, to for questions. Fantastic. Fantastic. Please, let's go. Uh, let, let's let's get let's get right into it. Okay, your first question is. How are blockchain logistics systems affected in a natural disaster like a hurricane? Discuss the current model versus a uh, potential new model. Who asked that question? It's anonymous. You can't. Anonymous I can, something. I, yeah. <laughs> okay. I can if start in. I mean, uh, this is ex exactly what we've discussed with DP World is this integration into ports. I mean, there should be a two-way communication with the ship. Uh, and, and, and that allows you to get right in the window that you can, you can get into. And if there is a hurricane on the way or in the port, you should uh, be able to allow uh, uh, this, this uh, real-time communica communication to get through to all the uh, 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 you know, infrastructure around it to, to adapt to that timing. Mm -hmm. That's Great. Yeah. But blockchain is, by, uh, by design, a very fault-tolerant um, technology it's 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 completely decentral exactly the same as how the internet works if you have a node in in, in the internet which uh, collapses due to a hurricane or an electricity uh, problem or whatever um, the network recovers itself and and, and, and and blockchain is in that uh, respect far more um, survivable than any central uh, central technology mm -hmm. I think hurricanes are something that you, you, you all know a little bit about here in Houston. <laughs> oh, well, I'm in there. Okay. Okay. Michael, do you want to do you want to mention something about that? When I hear of hurricanes at the port, I start worrying about our cranes. Yeah. First. Uh, so uh, you know, as an operations-minded person, uh, blockchain is going to come secondary to that. But to, to the general, to the comments already made. Uh, uh, and with the backups and with the things that we do with our terminal operating system and have uh, off-site backups and the ability to run remotely, uh, that would fall into the same category. So, the, you know, the, the bigger issue with storms is, is physical damage. Are, are, your, are your systems in the cloud or are they on uh, a, a, a terrestrial servers, as it were? <laughs> well, we have a combination of technologies and just think mm -hmm. about how fast cloud services took off. It used to be called application service providers. And now it's it's reinvented itself as cloud service providers or managed service providers. So um, we we are moving towards complete fault tolerance, and I'd imagine that some type of platform being discussed here today would be a part of that strategy. Yeah. Great. Okay. 
your next question is, down the road, do you see smart contracts potentially being used by the big players to collaborate? Um, could it potentially facilitate a monopoly? What? A what? A monopoly. Ah. Could, could, could. <clears throat> Yeah. The, the, yeah, it's a great I question. I don't see the EU allowing that. But. No, of course not. <laughs> not in a million years. Huh? <laughs> uh, well, the, the answer to the first part is yes, smart contracts is something that would be part of the roadmap. Uh, once you have that transparency, to act upon that in a split second by saying, okay, now that I have full transparency in what is going on, I don't need any kind of middle men, whatever kind of uh, interaction. But would it create monopolies? I have to think about that, you know. I uh, can't say yes or no. Huh? Um, it would be interesting to have that reflection from the person who asked the question, uh, wh what is the idea behind it, you know. Uh, but, it, but it was an anonymous question. So yeah, well, okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the person can always stand <laughs> up, you know. <laughs> yeah. Alexander, did you Yeah, I think, uh, I think, in fact, uh, it, 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 it is going that way. And I, if I, I may, uh, I may uh, also express my point of view is that I think transport industry is moving into a cost-saving model. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, the next competition is not going to be about companies, but about supply chains. You know, uh, supply, supply chain of, of a group of companies can compete against another supply chain in being the most efficient, time efficient, cost efficient of moving goods through this supply chain between, you know, one country and another. And that is the next competition. And, and the transport uh, part of it is going to be always going you know, towards uh, the best optimization of, of resources, timing, and, and cost. And, and a follow-up question to that is, how does that fact that, com that competition is moving in, the, in this direction disrupt e the existing market? Well, because the, the, the companies moving uh, into this are companies who actually sometimes they have their own production, they have their own transport, they have their own ships, their own terminals. And they even sometimes move commodity from one production center to another production center. Do you so their goal is to use the smart contract in optimizing the whole infrastructure between those two. Do you see that happening in the, in the, in the containerized world? Because you heard Soren Sko, the CEO of Maersk, within the last month said, if we can't do this uh, effectively, Amazon is going to come do it for us, yeah. something to that effect. Well, I think exactly that uh, Maersk is actually competing against Amazon and not uh, anymore against an, uh, other uh, shipping companies. And they are right in doing so. And I think this is why the, the partnership with IBM does not have a name, because it's going to be a supply chain that can integrate other players on basis of a smart contract into that supply chain. Yep. Good. The next question is, do you see self-driving trucks or auto other automa autonomous types of vehicles accelerating the adoption of blockchain, or do you feel as though they have a neutral effect? It's part of the question if blockchain is something valuable in the context of IoT, uh, where so the, the ships and trucks and whatever are examples of IoT, because they, they spit out so much data that there's something needed in order to process all of that and make sure that the, valid, the relevant data is passed on as part of a, an overall process that's taking place because all these ships and trucks that are driving around, they're doing something as part of a business process that is under execution. Uh, I think, yes, the question is to what extent? Uh, and is blockchain not going to be overwhelmed if you talk about IoT in the numbers of billions of devices? Uh, and would that make sense? So that's where you are starting to see, again, new architectures uh, with uh, edge computing and, and, and some kind of autonomy locally in combination with blockchain, in combination with other stuff. But that is still very much, to my opinion, very cloudy on where that, that, that's going to go. Huh? Uh, but there is, a, there is, intuitively, you would say, uh, there is an opportunity for the two to come together and, and make something better. Yeah. Yeah. I can. If I can add to that. But my, my vision is that in the future, I think um, the three uh, technologies, IoT, blockchain, but also artificial intelligence will, will come closer and closer together. Now they are considered separately. But what is a little bit um, uh, well, risky or um, 
worrying is that two of those technologies, IoT, for instance, IoT produces a lot of data. And um, the guys who uh, have a lot of data um, will be able to do, to get most out of this uh, through uh, artificial intelligence. And so um, those two technologies are creating a, a concentration of, of power. And it comes back to the previous question, uh, is, is, is this technology creating uh, monopolies? I, I, my personal opinion is that, that IoT and artificial, artificial, artificial intelligence are more um, risky to, cre to create uh, monopolies. You see it now already with the Googles and the Facebooks. Those are the monopolists of the data right now and are very likely will become the, the, the dominant players in artificial intelligence because they have, they have access to the, to the data. And only blockchain in the, the, this collection of three technologies is, is the only technology that can counterbalance that a little bit and give uh, more, um, yeah, more power to the, the data providers. And, and to the individuals and, and, and to, the, to the companies. So, um, so I'm um, yep. yeah, curious how this, 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 this mix of technologies to what this will lead. Mm. And we actually, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, Alexander, very briefly, we, are, we already offered our solution to Rolls-Royce uh, uh, because, you know, you, you don't, again, this solution is there. Look at it, Tesla and Uber. You know, it's, it's, uh, it already works. You don't have to think that shipping is much more complex than, than cars. In fact, it's, it's even easier. You know, you have maps, you have uh, real-time data, you have an autonomous ship, easily compatible with any uh, algorithm that, that that's out there. So this solution is already there. It's it's being uh, you know uh, s slowly integrated, and and I'm sure within a couple of years you will see see it in, in, in action. So it, it sort of begs the question: that Who are going to be the dominant powers in the shipping world in the future? Supply chains. And how will that re result in changes to the business that we live in every day? Transport, transport will become, uh, you know, will continuously try to be more and more efficient, leading to, you know, all sorts of innovation, be it autonomous ships, autonomous trucks, ports, uh, you know, better timing, maybe less storage uh, uh, because of uh, real-time uh, planning and, and things like that. So always you know, coming to, and actually countries with uh, adopting that from the legislation point of view will be more better, safer, and uh, less costly to live in for, this, mm -hmm. for the society. Mm -hmm. in, in, yes. Last year there was a study published um, by a, a Belgian, uh, but who also works in Shanghai and so on, um, economics professor in maritime, a bit of focus on maritime industry, on what is the future of port logistics. And um, one of the diagrams was fairly interesting in the sense that he asked, where do you see uh, the different stakeholders move in terms of more or less important in the digital supply chain? And uh, maybe it didn't come as a surprise, but IT-like kind of players, so companies that are really good in data processing, those are the ones that are going to be really dominant in the spectrum. But not. But all the others, they didn't disappear. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, there's still a role for forwarders. And I can give you a brilliant example of a forwarder in the port of Antwerp who saw digitalization coming and said, OK, what is our future going to be? Uh, and they're very much into data processing because they can become a consultant for their clients in dollars? optimizing their supply chain. And then if the client also wants them to do the <laughs> physical thing, like the warehousing and so on, they can still do that. Uh, but they shift in the value chain by mining the data they're sitting on and use that as the key differentiator and selling argument in dealing with their clients. Mm -hmm. So that's a brilliant example of how a traditional type of function where everybody says, well, those are going to disappear because of the middleman. It depends. You know? if, if change is coming and the only reaction is, oh, I'm going to run away, then you're going to be dead. Simple as that, but that's not the, that's not the idea, that's, but that's never been smart. It, regardless of whether we're talking about IT technology or not, there's never been a smart move. Mm -hmm. But if you embrace it right, and you think about, okay, what do I still have as key assets and key competencies I can use to leverage on what is now being thrown at me, 
then you see companies evolve. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but at the end of the day, it's about understanding that data has become your prime production mm -hmm. factor and everything else follows out of that. It was an interesting, uh, maybe some of you saw about three weeks ago, The, the Economist ran a, a long article about, about ocean container shipping and logistics. And, and it was kind of, anyway, it was very interesting. One of the points that they made was, uh, and Alexander, I think this kind of gets to your point a little bit, was that those entities that have data on customers are, are in a vastly greater position than those that don't. And they pointed out the difference between Amazon and Maersk. And they said that Amazon knows everything there is to know about customers. And they said that Maersk knows nothing about customers. Now, now they, they just use Maersk because that was the example they used. But it's the same for Yang Ming or, or MSC or, or, or even, you know, or, or even you know, the freight forwarders to a, cert, to a certain degree. Uh, and, and maybe does this get to this question of, of you know, supply chains and a, a drive, you know, being the, being the primary driver, those supply chains being informed by the, the the most valuable data that exists, which is the data on you know on customer behavior and uh, you know customer preferences and so forth. Well, even look at it, look at it from this point of view. The, the contents of a containers can sometimes uh, you know account to millions of dollars. Take hundred containers, that's much more. What is the cost of moving hundred containers from China to to the U.S.? I mean, we are speaking about very you know irrelevant amount so would it from a perspective of some company be wise to actually control a certain production or a certain uh, community by actually ab absorbing that cost that could also be a, a you know a something to think about mm -hmm. you know absorb a cost of moving goods to a certain com community put that in the price and try to optimize it and you know control it or a production or a certain com you know yeah Um, one of the things I see with this information technology, uh, it's based upon the information, but one of the critical things I see is uh, the need for a supply chain ontology, uh, supply chain ontology uh, even to the heavyweight perspective to where the machines can talk to machines. Uh, I'm wondering if you guys are seeing the same thing. So, so w one day there will be no need for humans whatsoever. We should prepare ourselves. For yeah. That. Okay. But that—that that was even the philosophy of the future when um, uh, Keynes wrote his books eh, on the future of, of work. Didn't really happen. So I still see a bright future for for mankind as part of the equation. <laughs> eh? uh, when when, when <laughs> Deep Blue optimist. when Deep Blue uh, beat it, the best chess player on the planet. Eh? Two years later, every stupid chess computer of ninety nine dollars could beat anyone on the planet. Guess what? Then you started to see a new kind of competition, a human being and a computer together playing another human being and a computer together. And that was something of a higher order. Huh? Uh, we're still far, far away from the time where computers can do everything we can. Huh? Everything that's operational, predictable, batch, whatever, fine. But don't overestimate where we currently are. Mm -hmm. huh? Maybe you heard the example from Google about a week ago where a robot called to make a reservation for somebody for the first time and and fooled the restaurant into thinking it was a real human. Charles. So, so I'll offer this comment. I think there's, an, in, in addition to what Erwin said, there are absolutely applications for machine learning when we can't analyze the data in a fast enough fashion to make a decision as humans. Um, specifically, there are certain trends that happen in cybersecurity that might be a global decision that we're really interested from a cybersecurity and information security perspective and investigating. Um, you can watch some maps in some very secret places and you can watch attacks happen and start in one part of the world, move to the other part of the world and move back. Um, if that might impact um, our stakeholders and, and people who are taking advantage of supply chain technologies and interacting with our port operators, we definitely need to pay attention because we gotta drive information in cybersecurity in every asset and service. Greek, a great question, which which is that that if uh, you know in the age of cyber attacks and and and, and we saw that uh, you know when 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 you know go, I hate to keep picking on Maersk, but you know they 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 were in fact you know brought to their knees by the by the uh, 
the, the cyber attack last year that also affected TNT and many others. Um, when we talk about blockchain, we talk about encrypted data. Is, is the need to uh, pr uh, protect against cyber driving at all the rationale uh, behind uh, blockchain? I, I see them as independent um, paths to take. We're going to do cyber and information security regardless of whether or not um, the success of blockchain blockchain won't determine that. If you don't have good um, policies, standards, procedures, and guidelines, and ways to deal with risk management, because something's going to happen, um, then you're not headed down the right path. And then, you know, in their is, uh, defense, they weren't even the primary target. And that's a, that would be a typical example of trying to find a solution and technology for something that is basically going wrong at another level. Huh? Uh, if you refer to the Maersk uh, attack or the, uh, okay, Maersk, that was, they were the victim of, of uh, state engineered kind of uh, uh, cyber attack. But uh, another famous one of uh, the last few years, the WannaCry outbreak. There was a patch already available for three months. So any company that was affected by WannaCry basically hadn't have his basic security in order. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and if that is the case, when you're lacking behind, let's say the basics, the hygiene factor in cybersecurity, adding uh, blockchain um, encryption on top of that isn't going to help you. Uh, and we see, uh, if you if you an analyze the, the huge outbreaks in cyber uh, attacks or, or companies affected by cyber attacks, it's often the case that either there was uh, something really wrong in the attitude of end users, or the basics weren't in order. Yeah, so, good. Um, any other questions? I, I will just yep. add one one more. I think the, the origin of the experiment of actually, in, I think it was in Switzerland and, and in Sweden where they try to implement uh, a, a, an, um, a minimum wage for all the citizens uh, of a cert certain area or a country uh, in Switzerland. Yeah? I think that's the origin of actually long-term thinking as, as to what is going to happen if, if you know, there is less and less jobs. What are people going to do? What is their, you know, what, what is their uh, role in the community? It's so, a huge, this is an enormous question. Yeah, so uh, let's the, not touch that. Well, we had the, uh, uh, at, at our TPM conference, we had the, the chairman of the Sri Lanka Port Authority, which connects to all the South Asian ports. Uh, and those are, you know, like, uh, you know, Chittagong and Bangladesh. Uh, wh what, are, what was one of the chief concerns that he raised was the, the possibility of mass automation in, uh, in apparel manufacturing. Because you're talking about, you know, they're they're figuring it out how to how to make clothing with without people, and and there are, you know, literally millions of people in South Asia who are employed right now, who uh, make making clothing that we all wear, and, you know, they may not be needed in you know a relatively short period of time. That's yeah. a huge issue. Yeah, but history might provide us again with some valuable lessons. Actually, what we're going through is the fifth technology wave since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Eh? And think about it, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, all the people were doing manual work, all of a sudden had the same kind of issue eh? that, that we're currently facing. And every technology wave has, has an installation period of roughly speaking three decades where technology com gradually comes into the, uh, in, into the economic activity in society and so on. And then the second phase is a maturity one where you leverage on the technology that has installed itself in society. But in between those two phases, you have a disruption phase and the transition phase. And that's actually what we, according to my opinion, are now going through as well. And that gives the impression that uh, it's very negative and that a lot of people will lose. But if you look at it from an historical perspective, the second phase has always been more prosperity for more people. Uh, but you have to go through that phase. And the question is now, is it going too fast for us to adopt? Uh, and that is probably the case. And that makes it such a, a scary kind of thing. Uh. But you have to keep in mind that in five years from now, we will be talking about jobs we don't even, we don't even have a word for it right now. Uh. Yep. The question is, what kind of a minimum level do you need to have in order to be uh, an applicant for that kind of jobs. Huh? Yep, yep, good. Um, maybe just one one more question. Yeah, we, I, I, have a, then, I, have a, yep. I have several questions on Twitter, but uh, apparently some, some folks are not very hungry right now, and you know who you are because you keep asking questions on Twitter. 
But uh, we will get to those questions uh, throughout the day. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll head to lunch. And the next question is, visibility and transparency are some of the goals of blockchain. How are these two elements going to affect contract and price negotiations between BCOs and service providers? Is this something that might make players hesitant to join this technology? Um, I, I'm going to, I read an article, so I don't, I'm not a, a, um, an expert on this, but there's, there's this platform in, called the New York Shipping Exchange where the BCO has to guarantee they're going to put cargo on a ship and pay potentially a, a penalty if they don't. It's like buying a ticket for an airplane and then saying, eh, I don't want to go, paying a change fee or whatever it might be. Um, that, if you don't know anything about it, Mike, I'm sorry, John Mosley does. He's over there. Or you can go find the article. I think it's N-Y-S-H-E-X. I think that um, from what I read, it, if they follow the airline industry and there won't be any underbookings, there'll be overbookings and the, uh, the, the ship, the uh, the carriers can actually optimize space on these large ships that they want to do for container movement. Great. Alexander, you want to yeah, quickly sorry, yeah. jump in yeah. and then and then maybe well, we'll take one more after that. What do you, what do you think? Or I mean, I'm happy to keep going, I, but but yeah, I think one, one more. I, after I that. think there are two one ways. That, I think there are two ways to look at it. For, on the one hand side, if you take uh, into consideration the supply chain, like uh, like for example, like Maersk or a bigger company that has all the assets uh, inside. They don't care about the transparency of price because this is their infrastructure, you know. So they will always compete to others who are trying to compile something on basis of smart contracts, individual smart smart contracts, and and for those there are ways to actually to to have individual data of financial data which is off the blockchain, and yet work within the blockchain based on Internet of Things. So it's not it's a misconception to think that you necessarily have to. Uh, open up the financial, uh, you know, the financial side of it. But of course, you should always remember that there are huge groups who will always disrupt it by building a big group with everything, you know, inside, and then you know where where all this this information will be open. Great. Uh, one more, one final question, and yeah, then we'll go to question. lunch. What is the single most important obstacle in implementing a blockchain initiative in the supply chain context? And then, and, and here, you know what it should be? It should just be a one word answer. Okay. Cost, hassle, ignorance. Yeah, lack of knowledge, yeah. Organizational change management people, uh, the way people think. I have three, but I'll pick one. One standard. What, what is it? One standard. One standard, yep. Unfortunately, I wanted to say the same. Standard. This one, I'll skip. Sorry? No. I'll skip this one. I can't, I can't name. I think it's uh, critical mass or you know, the Scale. Internet of Things. Uh, that, that would be one, one big thing about. Uh, yeah. Good, good. Well, how about a nice round of applause? What a great panel. Thank you, guys.